hear you all. And so we say about Kelly is she really has no hobbies because she's working on her PhD, right, you all? Yeah. And welcome this afternoon. I will tell you what we sometimes say in Allen for the afternoon, that it is the black hole of professional development. So you, you are not in the black hole. Let's just say that. Shall we say that? Yeah. But we're, we're delighted you're here to join us. And um, Allen, Texas is a suburb 30 miles north of the city of Dallas. And we are currently, in, have finished our second year with Canvas for grades 7 through 12. So we've been rolling it in. And we, we currently have 170 teachers in. But next year, all 367 through 12 teachers will be in in all courses. So students will have seven courses or however many they take. So what we wanted to do was tell you a little bit about why, why it's gone so well for us. And we'll share with you that it has gone well for us. And we thought we'd show you some lessons. Because I don't know about you all, but it's, it's so nice if somebody shows you what they're doing, doesn't it? And that's what our teachers say. They say, will you show that to us? So a couple things to get us started to tell you why it's gone so well. So one of the things we worked together on, and in Allen, it was a real team, and it still is a team, of teacher leaders and administrators. And we tried to take a big idea and make it small. So these are one of the things we created. We created this piece that we call essentials that said to folks, Here's what we think works, and here's what we think will work in your content area, so let's try these. And so I regularly meet with our secondary principals, and we said, so every nine weeks, Eric can do an announcement. So last week in training, people wrote a welcome back to school announcement, and they have it ready to go. And people can do a discussion, and people can do one one online quiz, and it might be for practice, because our kids love practice quizzes. In fact, um, last year, um, one of our other tech ISs before Kelly came said to me, Lisa, the, the kids in pre-AP physics, only 60% of them took the practice quiz. I said, Justin, 60% of 16-year-olds did something voluntarily, you know? That's huge, y'all. So you can tell that we define what we'd like to see in Canvas for our students. And then that's actually a rating scale that we use at competition in Texas. So a one is really good. We put it on the same rating scale that they get in fine arts and other competition. And we call it essentials. So this has been very helpful for our teachers because sometimes they, just, they say, will you just tell me what you want me to do? Don't you all agree? They do. And so that's been helpful. The other thing that's been very helpful for us, and those of you who have already started have probably done many of this same kind of thing, we have an online course that everybody does before they get access to Canvas. We have face-to-face um, -face training that we do. And I frequently say to them, this is not a tool we're going to throw out there and say, go for it, gang. We walk through why we're doing it, giving purpose. We talk a lot about blended learning. Um, we also then teach them the different components and give them time to work. Okay? A, a large part of our face-to-face -face training is folks working and creating, and we're there to help them. And we sit beside people. We then also continue to do that. We have ongoing follow-up professional development. We go out and meet in teams um, during their planning time in their PLCs. We will go in and co-teach. We said to folks last week, When's the first day you're going to do it? We'll come to your classroom and, and help you use Canvas in your classroom. Okay? So we do all of that. We also last year did some Twitter chats and some Canvas conferences. And that was fun. And we want to do more of that. So with all of that, two years in, I can share this with you. And we just heard a little while ago in the keynote about data. And so there's lots of data that you can, you can find about usage. We wanted to see where students were participating and interacting. You know, we could use Canvas for storage, and it's great to load files. I mean, in a student's absent, load all your files in. So you never have to answer the question about where the handout was. You just say, did you look in Canvas? Did you look in Canvas? Did you look in Canvas? But this is pretty cool, because we wanted to know electronic submissions. And it's pretty fun to say to our community and to our school board, look, we had almost 200,000 electronic submissions in the fall. 
We think that's pretty cool. The other thing that we're pretty excited about is that 77% of the teachers who were in then, which is right around 140, were, were doing electronic pieces in Canvas. Kids were interacting. So um, we think we've got um, some good things rolling, and now we've got all those 77% teachers who can tell the, the others, the 360 more, that it'll be okay. You can do this. Another piece we talk about is, is while we're defining what we're doing and, and trying to make a big idea smaller, we're not stopping anybody's creativity. But if we, if we encourage our teachers to be creative and we make it coherent for them, um, what's happening in the district, that we're going to have some success. We've been talking in Allen, as you all have, everybody's been talking about student-centered learning for a long time. So that's been a conversation for us. And we actually have a data gathering tool that looks at student-centered lessons, looks for when students are doing the work and not the teacher. So we've used some of that data. And we use that data along with the, the, the electronic submission data that helps us to inform our ongoing professional learning. And we know, oh, this team, this team hasn't done a quiz. I wonder what's going on. Let's go ask them, what support do you need? And so that's been important to us as we build this systematic way to provide an experience for our almost 10,000 7th through 12th grade students. And thinking, if we, if we make it through next year, which we will, it'll be an awesome year, but then we're going to head on down to elementary after that. Uh, so there's um, kind of a brief brief ideas about some things we did that we think helped us be successful. So here's one of our success stories, and I'll let you look at that. Yeah. And Crystal Trotter is sitting right here. She's the teacher who did that, and if you are an ELA teacher, you know that literature circles are sacred, right? So she worked on virtual little literature circles. So you can see students got to choose their own novel out of a choice of about five. And then they participated in discussions in Canvas across class periods. It wasn't just students in their class period. Crystal used roles, and that's what we do to help our students manage that piece. And then in class, in their class groups, they had the PowerPoint and submitted that. So this is a wonderful blended lesson, isn't it, y'all? Multi-steps. So another piece that Crystal did was she went ahead. We are a Google district also, have it pulled in in Canvas. So she created a Google Doc that showed them what their roles were. And then she went ahead and embedded it in for them in an assignment so it was easy for them to find. So here's what you see. You see this discussion going on, and I took the student names out to not violate FERPA today. And um, you can see, if you can see that, that they are con making real world connections, which is a piece and was one of their roles. And that's so important to English teachers, connecting to other literature or connecting to the real world. And then, many of you are probably experienced, so you know what that looks like in SpeedGrader. So there's the PowerPoint uploaded. She actually had them record their presentations, upload all that, and then she's sitting at home um, in bed if she wants to take her laptop in there with her, and she's grading those pieces. Pretty cool beans, don't you all think? Pretty cool stuff. And um, another one of our favorite um, rock star Canvas teams is American Sign Language. And if you think about technology, that fits that group, doesn't it? So they use a lot of video, of course, and this, I'll let you look at this assignment. The difference here is you see they're using the peer review piece. So she actually had a teacher rubric and a student rubric. She created this first student rubric, but in the future, her students will help her create the rubric because that's a part of student-centered learning, isn't it? So, oops. So um, you, will, you will see in their Canvas courses where they've gone in and they've commented on each other's um, videos that they put in there. Okay, I'm gonna take you through a few of the um, other lessons. My job is as an instructional specialist, I go and I work with teams. I'm an instructional specialist for technology. So specifically, I help them take their lessons and make it work in Canvas mostly. Um, but 
in reality, instead of me bringing ideas, I find that I work with amazing teachers and they have the best ideas. And so then I take their ideas and give them to other teams so that they can have great ideas as well. This is an Algebra 1 team. A lot of our teachers flip in Allen. It is not a requirement, but it is a good strategy. And if it's a strategy their team likes, then they can choose to use it. And so in this strategy, this Algebra 1 flips a homework assignment. So the teacher will give embedded video with an explanation, and the kids will either have notes with kind of fill-in spaces as they watch the video and sample questions that they have to fill in. At the end, they have to um, submit any questions that they have after the video so the teacher can be prepared to answer them and address them the next day. If they understand everything and they think they're great, then they're supposed to submit a question that they think will stump their, their fellow classmates. Um, and so then they can address that. In Algebra 2, one of our teachers decided to use discussions for office hours. Okay? We know that at the K-12 level, we do a lot of tutorials, but we don't really refer to them as office hours, like, like your professors in college will have office hours. And so she said office hours. She actually set them. I'll show you what it looks like. She actually set them for an evening um, prior to a test. And she said, you know, if you want to get on and post the discussion, I'll be there and I'll answer it right then. But the reason she chose to do a discussion is because kids that weren't available could post questions in advance and she could answer them. Or kids that weren't available to do it beforehand could go back afterwards and look for those questions and do it after the fact. Several of our teachers have now caught on to this. The students really liked it. And so several of them have chosen to do this now prior to big tests and, and kind of big things. In geometry, geometry loves the graph builder. Okay, so the graph builder will allow them to allow the students to create a graph. Um, for this particular assignment, the teachers gave kids three lines. And the challenge was that the kid has to come up with the equation for the fourth line to make a parallel quadrilateral, a parallelogram, which is quadrilateral. And in doing so, the kids also had they had to build it in graph builder. They had a writing component to justify their answer and how they know that it made a parallelogram. Um, to, no, we don't. Okay, so in that, one of our teachers even took it a step further. He also added it to peer review. And in peer review, the challenge was that the kids had to say if their um, peer that they were assigned to was correct, if it was different than their answer, and they were both correct, or if one was wrong and one was correct, because there's lots of different lines that could make that um, make it a four-sided shape. All right, so in Algebra 2, like we showed before, some of them flip, but the notes are still important. Um, a lot of them will go back and add the notes after the fact. They don't add it before the kids watch the video, or then they'll just copy the notes. Um, but after the fact, they'll go back and add teacher-created notes, and they color code them so that the kids can follow um, where they get the variable or where the numbers are changing and what lines go with what numbers. Yeah, I told Kelly that reminds some of us in the room of having an overhead projector. Don't y'all agree? And the vis-a-vis -vis all down your arm, right? Here's a virtual version of that, but I guess you don't have a messy arm doing it that way, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, flip mastery. So some of our teachers not only flip, they go a step further and they do flip mastery. Our anatomy class is one um, where the teacher really enjoys flip mastery. Flip mastery is where you flip your lessons and you do activities in the classroom just like a traditional flip, but it also allows the kids to progress at their own pace. And so a kid has to prove that they've mastered something. In her case, she has said that they have to make a 70 or greater on a quiz in order to move to the next module, next unit. And so when the kids have reached that, they can move on to the next unit. So it takes some flexibility on the teacher's part because you have to be available and flexible for kids to be at different places at different times. But it really works well in her classes. And she can pull small groups of kids that are struggling on certain areas. And so when you go in her class, you'll find people doing five or six different things, but they tend to really be on task and enjoying it. Yes, ma'am. No. OK. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, there are ways you can set up prerequisites. Our beginning teachers, we usually don't start off with prerequisites right away. Um, but then some that are more curious, we go ahead and let them try. Yes. 
One of the pieces oh. about using a prerequisite like that is secondary teachers have to remember that they're teaching a new tool. So you have to teach that idea to your students. And that's why we've hesitated to have um, all but anyone who's completely gung-ho. Because kids, kid, you've got some processes to teach students. Uh, right. When we switched to Canvas, we had a few teachers that were already doing flipped mastery. Um, they were just using websites and kind of all over the place. So Canvas allowed us to put it in one place. And so with those teachers, we gave them the tools to use in the classroom the way they wanted to use it. Okay. So her question really was she was new to Canvas and wanted to know how to set up like how to limit kids from moving ahead when they weren't ready yet. Okay, so in science in eighth grade, they use Edpuzzle. Edpuzzle is an external app that you can use in Canvas. Um, it allows you to take a video, but then cut up the video and embed questions, okay, or other things. Um, our teachers embed questions, and then they take that video and embed it in a quiz. And they will copy the questions in the video in the quiz. So as a student gets to that question in the video, the video in Edpuzzle won't let them progress until they answer it, and they also will answer it in the quiz on Canvas. That way, you know that they're paying attention to the video, and you also get a grade at the end if you wanted to take a grade on it. So it's the, it's the student version of defensivedriving.com, and maybe many of you maybe haven't had to take that, but it's what it works. Question over here. Yes, that is a feature to Edpuzzle. So the question is, um, how does the video work? And, and Kelly? Yeah, um, he asked if you, could pro if you could progress without answering the question. And, and the answer is, you have to answer the question for Edpuzzle to allow you to go to the next section of the video. Yeah, Isn't that it's cool? really yeah, cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Because kids and all of us love to fast forward on video. We'll just admit to it, won't we, y'all? And so here's a picture of what it looks like. Um, it's just a video, and then there's um, different questions and prompts that they'll get to at different points. And you can see that there's different, on the bar at the bottom, there's places where there are questions. And so that's where the video would stop, and they'd have to address that question. In seventh grade, um, in seventh grade science, they use Quizlet. Quizlet is like old school flashcards meets technology, okay? And so you can do something very basic. It's great for vocabulary. You can do something very basic like this that looks like a flashcard. It has a name on, or a vocabulary word on one side. You flip it over, it's got the definition. There's also lots of different activities, matching, sorting, that sort of thing, which is also an external app that you can use in, in Canvas so that when the kids do it, they're not leaving Canvas and getting lost and never finding their way back. <laughs> And so here's some other, these are some questions that are in Quizlet. There's also matching and some other things. We also use smart boards in, um, in our teaching. We have smart boards in most, if not all, of our classrooms. And so you can actually embed smart board in Canvas. We also have smart notebook, which is the, the technology or the software that runs smart board. And we have it, it loaded on our student desktops and student computers. And so kids can do an activity. This is chemistry where they're sorting different types of energy. So chemistry, again, is another really vocabulary-heavy topic, but a lot of times words are associated with each other. And so they do a lot of sorting through SmartBoard. Then the kids can just save what they did and submit it back up. They, this case, they submit it as a PowerPoint. It could be a PowerPoint or a PDF. When they submit it back up into Canvas, the teacher can open it in SpeedGrader, and he can quickly just look at it and be like, oh, yeah, he got that right, and then grade it right there. Yes, ma'am? going blank right now. Um, let me look. I, I can answer that, but just not on the slide. I don't remember. She was wondering how you embed SmartBoard Notebook into Canvas, um, and I'm drawing a blank right now. I have a click sheet that does it. Um, if you will give me your email address, I can send it to you. It is possible. I just can't it's remember okay. right now. No, I can't either. Yes, ma'am. Um, she asked if I knew about Prometheum, if that could embed. 
I don't know. Just because we use SmartBoard, we don't have Prometheum, so I don't have any experience with it, but it sounds like it probably would. They do a lot of the same things. That's completely a guess on my part. AP Biology. I get really excited when I get to go talk to the AP Biology teacher because that was what I taught. Um, and our AP Biology teacher, she um, did an organelle in chief election. So an organelle is a cell part, and the kids all got a cell part, and they had to decide what was the best cell part and which one should rule all other cell parts. Okay, And so they elected the organelle in chief. In AP Biology, you don't, you don't only need to know a lot of facts. You need to know how things interact and work with each other. And so this challenged the kids um, to investigate that and learn on their own. And they did a lot of work outside of the classroom just for fun so they could win. They had um, choices. So they had to do flyers, posters, speeches. They even could do um, campaigns on, on Twitter. And they had to do memes. So here's some memes. You have to really understand what your um, organelle does in order to be able to put it concisely in a really small amount of text. And so some of these memes are pretty funny. Um, some of them, they were allowed to find them because believe it or not, they're out there. Um, and then some of them could not. Okay. They also did uh, Twitter campaigns. And like any good election, mudslinging was allowed within limits. <laughs> okay. Um, eighth grade history. Oops. I'll take it from there. And so what you're seeing here at the end are some of our teachers, um, most veteran teachers, or maybe not um, really excited at the beginning. And that would be true of AP Bio. You'll also see some flipped. Not everybody in Allen flips with Flip Classroom. And we know there are folks who, who um, prefer, and we say at times, that we're going to do a lecture model. Some days we're going to teach from the front of the room. We've just really captured the power of video. And we're really using our time for student-centered learning in the classroom, using the time for collaboration, using the time to touch base with students so we're hearing them. So here's a blended lesson from eighth history. So it starts off about political pro um, parties. And then they worked through, we do always work on the Texas Constitution. I'll just tell you that happens. We are our own country. Um, um, and they worked on the principles, they did some drawings, hung them around the room, did that gallery walk around the room, and then kids had a quiz to complete about that, about the principles. So here's a little picture of that. They had to name the principles in the sketch. Pretty cool student-centered lesson. Teacher had some prep work to do, but the kids really did the learning there, didn't they? They did the work, because that's what we say. That's who we want to go home tired. We want the students going home tired, not the teacher. Um, another very veteran team is our government team, and we are so proud of them. There are two members on that team that have 40 years of experience in education, and a num another member who is a very busy football coach. And if you don't know football in Texas, you are busy with that when you do that job. Um, and so they created a similar idea. They were working on checks and balances. Kids, students created illustrations. They actually did a class presentation around it. And then they posted those in Canvas. And students had to reply to two other students' illustrations. So really got a solid, deep knowledge of checks and balances. And there's a, that's a pretty cool illustration. We have talented students, don't we all? And then I think we've got um, the other idea of moot court, because moot court happens in government also. He certainly started with a flipped video around moot court. And then what you see up there is this was a paperless assignment. Everything came through electronically using Google, writing a judge of decisions in Google, and submitting final products. So. Um, pretty proud and um, very appreciative of 40-year education veterans willing to take on something new. And I, we will tell you, they are still with us. Right? We haven't lost anyone yet. So we hope that you've gotten some good ideas. There's a piece of that. Some good idea of cool lessons. We will tell you we're pretty excited with the summer training we've done because we um, really have focused on the big four core, ELA, math, science, social studies, and foreign language. They're the fifth core. 
but we're getting ready to really um, support our fine arts teachers, um, PE and CTE. And we have had some fabulous fine arts folks in this week. Um, we had um, some gals in high school art, and they can think of all wonderful ideas. I had an email this morning from our tech theater teacher who had a question about SmartBoard, and then she was saying, I'm creating really fun stuff for next year. So we're excited that our teachers are excited. And I think we have a couple minutes for other questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, they are recording this. The question is, do you have a link to your slides and examples? They are recording this, and these are posted on the YouTube channel for Instructure after the conference. So you should be able to see it there. All right, great question. Another question? So, okay, good, because I was going to say, so it is the black hole of staff development that you're in. Another question. So his question is, in the first year, when did people get comfortable? So we're, 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 we're big, and we have 1,500 students per class in our high school. So we rolled it in small. We rolled in 60 teachers to begin. And so that allowed us, and we specifically took in some great technology users and some who were not. Um, I think one of the things about Allen is we have a wonderful collaborative culture between teachers, between administrators and teachers. We had one team that wasn't happy all year, um, but that was pretty good out of 60 teachers. And their real reason was that they'd had another tool they were using better, and so they um, were uncomfortable making the switch. The other piece for us is this is a part of a strategic plan. We were using teacher websites, Google sites. We had teachers creating their own thing, and we were all over the place. And our parents said to, you, said to us, we love you all. You're very innovative. Will you please stop? Because we have a million logins to find out what's going on in school. So that support really helped us. Um, so I hope that helps you, and we can talk some more about that. Another question? Okay, so this is a great question. Did your administration force people to use Canvas? So really our belief is we can't force you to do anything. We are adults. We are setting out an expectation and we defined ours. You saw ours in, in our essentials and we're here to support you. So that's our approach to it. Did we have to say to some people, this is bigger than you? This is about all the kids. This is about what's best for kids. Did we have to say that to some people? Sure we did. But that's just a conversation that we've had. The excitement about Canvas is contagious on our campus, though. As a couple of people get used to it and like it and love it, they tell others, and then they come on board. And so those people are becoming less and less fearful. And once they hit those expectations, our expectations for use is low. But once they do the minimum, they're finding, oh, this is great, and they, they far exceed the minimum. The, the real key is your teacher leaders. It doesn't matter what the director says. I mean, it's important what the director says, but to have a teacher leader who can sit down with another teacher who teaches what they do and help them with that. That happened last week. We have a very veteran teacher. She's a good teacher. She, she gets this year's new thing, so sometimes the strategy is let's just lay low and this too shall pass, right gang? She sent me an email after the first day of training because she's an eighth grade math teacher and an algebra teacher had showed her how to use SmartBoard and Canvas. And she sent me an email that said, thank you. I am so excited what I can do next year for my students. So that will happen. That Probably will six happen. of us had talked to her first, and it didn't matter okay. until it was another math teacher. Yep. And so exactly. using our teacher leaders has been very powerful. It's been critical. Important. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks you all for coming this afternoon. We hope it was helpful.